Hey, how are y'all living, my homies and my homegirls? I hope you're all still fighting the good fight against hair loss and making some glorious hair gains. Now, I am pleased to be back with y'all today to discuss some important news in the realm of hair loss, and that is on the development of a topical anti-androgen known as pyralutabine being developed by the Chinese company Kintor. It is also known by its chemical name, KX826, which kind of sounds like it could be the name of a Volvo, but what is important is the premise behind this drug, and that is that it's supposed to be a topical treatment that targets androgens on the scalp with little to no systemic side effects. Unlike finasteride, which targets the 5AR enzyme that converts testosterone into the hair-destroying trash hormone DHT, pyralutamide is supposed to work by directly blocking the androgen receptor and thus not allowing DHT to bind with the receptor and destroy the hair, as you can see here. In that regard, it can kind of be compared to something like clascoterone, which was recently FDA approved for the treatment of acne and is currently undergoing FDA approval for hair loss. Like clascoterone, pyralutamide is also being developed as an acne treatment, but unlike clascoterone, it will probably be approved for tr the treatment of hair loss before it is approved for acne, which is interesting. So this all sounds great, right? I mean, we already have two fantastic treatments for treating hair loss with finasteride and minoxidil, both of which are clinically proven to be both safe and effective, especially when they're used together, but there is, of course, no such thing as a drug with a 100% positive response rate or with a 0% risk of side effects. So having other clinically proven choices choices is always a good thing, even if the majority of people who think they can't use finasteride are just imagining they can't because they gave themselves a nocebo effect by giving into the fear-mongering of internet basement-dwelling hypochondriacs. So before we go as balls deep as we can on this treatment and talk about the existing research, let's give some background on the company behind it and what led to its eventual development. So, like I said, the drug is being developed and researched by a company called Kintor, which is a Chinese company started in 2009 that specializes in developing anti-androgens. The big drug that they're most known for is called peroxalutabide, which is an anti-androgen being developed for treating prostate and breast cancer, which may sound a little bit weird since we usually think of breast cancer as something that's more estrogen dependent, but there are certain breast cancers that have androgen receptors and are treated with androgen blockers. Proxalutabide is currently in phase three trials, which means very large scale trials that a drug undergoes before being finalized for FDA approval. And we're usually talking about hundreds or thousands of subjects. Interestingly enough though, it is also being researched as possibly having some effect on the coronavirus, since we know it is the androgen receptor that helps the virus get into the cells. And that is of course another subject entirely but if you are interested in knowing more about how finasteride and other anti-androgens can potentially help fight COVID-19, then I'll link the video I did about the subject below if you want to watch. So, of course, there will always be a demand for developing drugs which fight, fight cancer, as there is, of course, no cure for cancer. Kinter, though, realizing that hair loss is almost as much of a death sentence as cancer, has invested their resources in helping to stop the slaphead curse from destroying the lives of more people. And, you know, why wouldn't they? I mean, finasteride is one of the most prescribed drugs in the world, and they'd like to get a big piece of that juicy, hairy pie. I mean, who wouldn't? So unfortunately, we don't have any published studies, and essentially everything we know about this drug comes from the Kintor company, and it is written in a way that is designed to attract investors into investing in their company. So naturally, as you could expect, everything written about the drug is written in an extremely optimistic manner. So the drug is currently undergoing approval by NMPA, which is the Chinese equivalent to the FDA, and the company expects full approval of the drug in China by the end of 2022, hopefully. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know anything about the NMPA or how it compares to the FDA, but since China is a totalitarian Marxist state, I would imagine their federal agencies are probably pretty tightly regulated. Even if you don't trust the NMPA, though, the drug is fortunately also undergoing FDA evaluation in the United States. The latest updates from the company from March 26th of this year, 2021, say that Phase 1 and Phase 1B trials in China have been completed, and we do have some data to report on these on these results. And also, the U.S. Phase 1B trial has been completed as well, but we don't expect to hear the results until later this year. Also, a Phase 2 trial in China has been completed, but again, we won't hear any results until the end of 2021. 
2021 at the earliest. All these trials are based on hair loss, but there is also an acne phase 1 trial which is currently enrolling patients as well. So what we know about the drug is based on phase 1 and 1b studies that have been done in China. What this means is that phase 1 studies are human studies looking at the effect of the drug on healthy subjects who may or may not even have androgenic alopecia at all. I mean, they are really just making sure there are no terrible, life-threatening side effects that happen immediately, and they are not an indicator of like the long-term safety of the drug, and that's what the subsequent phases are for. So they are not looking at effectiveness in this phase at all, though they may be looking for things like about how the drug is metabolized and excreted just to see how safe it is. So in phase 1, each subject gets a single dose level, but in phase 1b, they increase the dose of the drug that are given to the subjects just to be complete. So in phase 2, they enroll subjects who actually have the disease they are studying and usually enroll several hundred subjects. Finally, in phase 3, there are even more subjects, sometimes thousands, and the follow-up is longer to try to make sure that there are no rare side effects that may have been missed in the previous um, trials. So the FDA is really the most comprehensive and thorough organization in the world when it comes to assessing a treatment's safety and efficacy, yet that somehow we still have people who would rather listen to random people online tell them that finasteride turned them into gay women, but that's besides the point entirely, of course. So what we have here are the results of phase 1 and 1b trials done in China, and what they looked at specifically was tolerance of the drug and how it was metabolized at different doses. These trials both observed healthy individuals who didn't have androgenic alopecia, so this was a test to determine safety rather than efficacy, as I stressed earlier. So, in the Phase 1 trial, they enrolled 40 men and women to randomly receive doses ranging from 0.5 to 24 milligrams per day versus a placebo treatment. In Phase 1b, 32 healthy men and women received increasing doses of the drug ranging from 0.5 milligrams to 12 milligrams per day. Since these subjects weren't slapheads, they instead applied the treatment to their backs just to see how it absorbed through their skin. So what the research found, what the researchers found after each dose was that there was no severe adverse side effects and nobody had to drop out of the study due to side effects. However, about 40% of the subjects in the study did have mild side effects related to the drug, and that seems pretty high even if the side effects are minor. Almost all these side effects, though, were contact dermatitis, meaning there was irritation on the skin, not, not a systemic side effect. So you may be thinking to yourself, you know, oh, that's probably just the carrier solution, right? Well, no, because the placebo group also got the carrier solution, with the only difference being that the drug was not present in it, and they had significantly less contact dermatitis. So again, this is another fine example as to why you need a placebo control group to acquire good outcome data. This is something the PFS Foundation clearly hasn't learned yet. So anyways, the researchers looked at the blood samples, and they found that pyrolutamide, also known as KX826, as well as its metabolite, which is called KX982, were seen in the plasma of the subjects, and the amount that was seen was related to the dose as you see in this figure here showing that higher doses resulted in higher plasma levels of the drug and its metabolite. So if you're an investor interested in Kintor, this doesn't sound very good so far. So to counter this, the marketing department assured them that the levels were quote, quite low, unquote. And if you look at the graph, it looks like the levels are less than three nanograms per milliliter. But who knows how clinically significant that is? I mean, especially with just 40 test subjects. So, hot off the presses. Even though the final result of the United States Phase 1B trial aren't out until later this year, we do have some preliminary data that the company has just released. The U.S. trial has 30 male subjects with androgenic alopecia, 24 of them received the drug pyrolutamide, and 6 of them received the placebo treatment. In this study, they were looking at 3 different doses of the drug, which were 3 milligrams, 12 milligrams, and 48 milligrams, and each subject received just one dose, so clearly this was not a very long-term study at all. The preliminary results indicate that there were no deaths, so thank goodness for that. But also, fortunately, there were no severe side effects or any side effects causing the drug to be discontinued, so fans of pyrolutamide can rejoice knowing that one dose won't outright kill you and that the funding for the drug's research will likely continue for now. In this study, only 27% of the subjects had mild adverse effects, so they don't mention if it was contact dermatitis again, but 
chances are that it probably was just based on the outcome from the previous study. But in this study, they also looked at blood levels and they detected pyrolutamide in the blood in the patients who received 12 milligrams or 48 milligrams. And they found that pyrolutamide metabolite was only in the subjects who received the 48 milligram dose, as you can see in this graph here. So the researchers concluded that a single dose of up to 48 milligrams was safe with only minimal systemic absorption. However, the data we have seen so far seems to me to indicate that it would probably be safer to use a lower dose of the drug rather than a larger dose, although we have no idea how effective these doses are for treating hair loss and whether or not these lower doses would still have any effect at all. Because keep in mind, this is research on the drug's safety, not efficacy. And I'll get to that a little bit more later, but there is still one more trial I want to talk about first. This is a phase two trial, which is currently ongoing in China as, of, as we speak right now in the year 2021, and it involves five clinical centers, and they plan to enroll 160 men with androgenic alopecia, and the men will receive either 2.5 milligrams or 5 milligrams once or twice per day versus placebo. So my prediction that they plan to start with lower doses first has obviously come true, although this time they're not just testing for safety, but also efficacy. So hopefully this trial when completed will give us a better idea of the drug's effectiveness in treating androgenic alopecia. But like I said, we're not going to have any results until the end of 2021 at the earliest, so perhaps this is something we can revisit when that study is published. But for now, this is all we have as far as data goes on pyrolutamide. But before we conclude, let us take a look at some of the other drugs that are in the process of FDA approval. Not all these drugs are new drugs, like, you know, for instance, you can see dutasteride here, which is already widely used for androgenic alopecia, at least off-label, but it doesn't have FDA approval for it yet. But it is it, but it is currently in phase three clinical trials for that indication. Also seen here is SM04554, which I did a video on not too long ago that I'll link below in case you're interested. And it is distinct from the rest of the treatments here because of its unique mechanism of action. It is not a direct growth stimulant like minoxidil or an antiandrin like finasteride. Rather, it works through the WNT pathway, which again, I explained more in that, de in that video if you want to watch it. Uh, that video on specifically on SM04544, that is. But we also have a, a couple of prostaglandin treatments here. And I've also covered those in a video, which again, I'll link below. And there isn't much else to say about them other than that they're both in phase two trials. So we'll see what future research yields. And also we see CB0301, which is the chemical name for class cotteron, which is the active ingredient in Winlevy and Brizula. And I can tell you this table is out of date because CB0301 already has been FDA approved as Winlevy and it is in the phase three trials, I believe right now for hair loss, where it will be sold as Brizula. And I've discussed this treatment in various videos on my channel. Lastly, they mentioned another competitor called FOL005 which is categorized as a synthesized polypeptide as its mechanism of action, which I haven't covered yet, but it might be something worth looking into and exploring in a future video. But as of now, it looks like it is undergoing phase two trials, so maybe it's best to just let the research play out a bit more. Uh, but that's pretty much it as far as this drug's competitors are concerned. But I felt it was worth mentioning those just to keep everybody up to date in the world of research. But getting back to the subject of hand uh, and pyrolutamide, that is, the company is predicting FDA approval for androgenic alopecia by 2000. 2023 and for acne by 2024, but there are obviously a lot of steps needed before we see this drug become commercially available. So in case you fast forwarded ahead and just want a summary of everything we know about pyrolutamide, well, it's not a whole lot, but what we currently know is that it's a topical antiandrogen being developed by a Chinese company called Kintor. The initial trial showed no immediate risk of danger, though it seems like contact dermatitis is pretty frequent with side effects uh, affecting about 27 to 40% of subjects. It seems that there is some low systemic absorption at higher doses of the drug, which could be a problem because blocking androgens throughout the body may turn you into a worthless eunuch like Nicocado Avocado. However, and keep in mind this is just speculation here, but I suspect that just based on the name of this product that it may be similar to topolutamide, which some of you may know better as Fluoridil. Fluoridil isn't FDA approved, so it doesn't have nearly as much research as say something like finasteride, but what research does exist about the drug shows that it is an effective treatment and also doesn't have any systemic absorption since it is hydrophobic, hydrophobic and thus deactivated in the bloodstream. So the optimist in me is hoping that pyrolutamide will be something 
similar to Fluoridol, but FDA approved and possibly even stronger, but also with no verified systemic side effects like Fluoridol. So the fact that the subjects in the trial didn't report any systemic side effects leaves me feeling pretty optimistic about the drug's chances as being legitimate, though none of the reported studies involved long-term use of the drug, so I guess we'll have to see. But on the other hand, the name pyrolutamide also reminds me of flutamide or bicalutamide, and those two drugs are related to topolutamide, except they do absorb systemically and can cause uh, severe systemic side effects that harm a man's virility, thus making them non-viable uh, for treating hair loss safely. So I'm hoping pyrolutamide is more like fluoridol, also known as topolutamide, than it is like flutamide or bicalutamide, but I guess we'll have to wait and see what the phase two and phase three trials tell us. But in any case, unlike most of the stuff on the horizon, which is just overhyped fluff that the lab rats in the hair loss forum desperately wish to believe is the next big thing, I am genuinely curious and optimistic about pyrolutamide because it addresses hair loss from a familiar angle as it is an anti-androgen, and we know that androgens like DHT cause hair loss. So all that remains to be seen is if it's strong enough and if it's safe, and if so, then great, we have another weapon in the good fight against the slaphead curse. But in the meantime, though, I'd suggest just sticking with the clinically proven treatments that we know work like finasteride minoxidil because this pyrolutamide stuff is still at least a couple years away. So, you know, all right. With that, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I'll see you guys next time.